This is the GTN Show, welcome. After a busy few days out in Lanzarote, we're all back and we have an action-packed show for you, including stories from the icy waters of Antarctica, a record that turns out maybe not to be a record, as well as some news from Kona that might well interest you. On top of that, we are gonna be getting a little bit nosy this week and we're going to be looking at an array of your pain caves as well as taking a look at what some of the pros are getting up to at this time of year. And of course, we have our question time, our caption comp, and a little bit of race news. Right, well this time of year there's obviously less racing going on, so we wondered what the pros were up to. And we've done a little bit of investigating and found out that quite an array of things actually. And I think we've got a little bit of help yeah. just to guide us through because there's such an array including racing, charity work, mountain biking. We've got very nosy. Um, so one that really jumped out to me this past week was from Gustav Eden, who is a Norwegian triathlete, races mostly on the ITU circuit, although has dabbled with middle distance racing, Ironman 70.3, and was very, very good. Now he won Lausanne ITU World Cup, where he beat Johnny Brownlee, Christian Blumenfeld, his own fellow countryman. Yeah. So that was a very impressive performance. Now. He is obviously in the off season, but still posted a 5K time of 14.18. And if you look at the photo, there is ice on the ground. And that, I mean, running at that pace in that temperature makes it even more impressive. And that's not all, because this is all sort of part of a Norwegian training day, like a national camp. And he says he then, he said it was okay conditions. Then he went on to do a three by 30 minute TT at 300 watts, all alone on his turbo trainer. So what a day. I mean, he's laying it down there, isn't he, for the other pros to go, you know, before you eat too many mince pies, look what I'm doing. Yeah, well, <laughs> all the rest are just having a, having a jolly. But closer to home, we have noticed um, quite a lot of athletes swapping their, not just their TT bikes for road bikes, but going the next step down to mountain biking and getting a little bit dirty. Yeah, well you might have thought or be led to believe that a lot of the pros are very serious and they're always training hard and they, they never let their hair down. Well, you might, think differently if you had a look at some of their Instagrams lately because a lot of them are posting up photos of the mountain biking, cyclocross, going yeah. all off-road. So we've got Lucy Charles, she's been venturing off-road so we've seen a picture of her just plowing through I mean, that's like quite a brave, fjord, yeah. a, a river. <laughs> uh, we've got Alistair Brownie doing a lot of mountain biking at the yeah, moment. Yeah, well I mean we know he's very skilled on the bike so it's quite interesting to see him going back to some routes and probably, you know, yes it's fun but he'll still be getting valuable skills from, I mean, from out on this mountain bike. I've seen from Bucko obviously, been on the channel before and trains a lot with Alistair, they're posting up some big rides on the mountain bike so yeah. it almost seems like they just pop the road bikes aside for yeah. a while and they're putting in some big hours some and some hard riding. It's like yeah, they, it's when, they get, jolly, when yeah. they get onto the road as well, they're doing through and off and working hard so <laughs> it's, it's not just fun. Um, they've also got Sebastian Keenly here doing a bit of cyclocross riding, Richard Murray, He's classic, he loves his mountain biking. Yeah, well, I mean, biking. he lives in perfect situation, you know, location to go mountain biking. Um, and one other I spotted, Eric Lagerstrom, he's um, he's a big off-roader, loves doing a bit of cyclocross and mountain biking and whatnot, another Red Bull athlete, so yeah. as you'd imagine. Um, so yeah, that's just, a, that's just a handful we've picked out. There are more out there. Yeah, well, we've seen, I mean, even during sort of you know, mini breaks throughout their season, we saw the likes of Patrick Langer and Jan Fulino going out on their grail bikes and just, you know, getting a little bit of cross-training in as well. So it's this time of year, it's as much, I think, for the men mental side as a physical side for the pros. They're just starting to maybe think about getting back into training, but doing it in a slightly different way. Yeah, I mean, we're big advocates of it here on the channel. I think we've got that, <laughs> push that across the <laughs> that floor. That mentality, for sure. We, we all enjoy mountain biking, even Fraser. Um, yeah, and as you said, I think it's just a great, it's a great break from the usual grind of training. So yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Um, now, moving on, we've got another one here from Andreas Rayler. Now, he, his career has been incredible. So, and he's, he's basically remained so dominant for so many years, but in this past year, he's kind of just disappeared off the face of the earth. Yeah, well, I mean, he is at the age of 42. I think people were starting to wonder if maybe it was time that he was sort of hanging up his boots quietly, just going, I mean, no, normally athletes do announce a retirement, but maybe he was just, you know, we weren't really sure. But it turns out that he has put it out there. He set his sights on Kona 2019. Yeah, he posted up a picture with his his child, his new child this past year, which was possibly why he'd maybe been so quiet for most of the year. Um, but yeah, he's saying, yep, 
it's happening. I'm still in the game, which is great to hear. Um, and it's kind of posed the question of, when is it too old to be a pro in triathlon? Yeah. <laughs> we would like to know from you guys, and it's time to go to a poll here, what age would you say the pros should be retiring at? Obviously, you have no say in it. They will retire when they retire. But <laughs> we make that one clear. But if you were a pro and you were having to sacrifice all this stuff for your sport, um, what age do you think you would retire at? Yeah, well, the options are 25 to 29. Pretty young, I know. Then next, 30 to 34. 35 to 39. 40 to 44 or other, so I guess older. Well, let us know what you think, and like Mark said, you know, we're not gonna let the pros know, so don't worry, but we'd love to know what you think, so just vote in the link above my head. Now, for last week's poll, we asked you how many hours per week do you spend on the indoor trainer, which is good timing, considering how much indoor training where most of us are trying to do right now. Yeah, well, the results were in. We gave you four options and it came in at just 18% were naught to one hour. Then next, it was one to two hours with 19%, so pretty close. Then two to three hours, 29%. But the biggest percentage um, coming out on top, four hours plus were 34%. That is quite substantial, isn't it? Yeah. I, I did not expect so many people to be doing four Especially hours. Especially already, because I know, mm. I mean, I know we're talking Northern Hemisphere here, but it's still fairly early into winter, I think. <laughs> we need to get training here. I think so. Okay, Christmas is just around the corner. Yes, I have said it, and I know we are still in November, but there are some great deals right now on our GTN shop, and they end this Friday, so you need to be quick. Starting off, we've got three for two on the Pro Socks. And you can get our arm warmer and leg warmer bundle and get 10% off. Yeah, you can get a free small GTN towel when you order the fan kit bundle. And with our Pro Kit bundle, you can get a large GTN towel. Now that offer ends Friday this week, so get in there quick, yeah. get those deals, and get those stockings full. <laughs> well now for the news, and let's start things off with some recent news on a competition that took place in the icy waters of the Antarctica. Oh, the thought of that. <laughs> yeah, it was a swimming competition near Trinity Island in the Bay of Michelin Harbour. Yeah, well, there were 15 crazy enough athletes taking part in this from nine different countries, and it was a thousand metre swim, but the tough part was the air temperature was minus two degrees centigrade, and the water temperature, before you before you pick me up on this one, it's salt water, it was minus 0.8. Yeah, that's... <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine that's it. That's brutal. It was actually won by Peter Stoichev, so he is the first winner of this icy water swim, and he did it in a time of just over 11 minutes, and he found it so easy, in fact. <laughs> in the final few meters, he decides to do butterfly just to put a good show on for the people on the boat. And I think he won by by over a minute. So, I mean, it doesn't actually say how many people finished and <laughs> survived, but I don't know how he survived, actually. Well, he said his body temperature before he started was 37.3, and then when he finished, it was 30.8 degrees Celsius. I mean, I didn't know that it was humanly possible for the body to fluctuate that much and not to have serious like I, organ shutdown. I agree, I thought if your body temperature went three degrees Celsius either way yeah. from the normal recommended um, degree, then you, yeah, you're in trouble. Yeah. Your body goes into shutdown. I mean, I don't know how he could do anything, how he could even think enough to think to do butterfly at the end. Like your brain surely would just not have enough blood flowing to it. And I don't know how this event is allowed to happen and like where it becomes dangerous. Well, we, we have done a little bit of research and we've actually found out that you can in fact go right down to 21 degrees Celsius <laughs> before your body really, really does go into shutdown. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, I think that's where you die. Yeah. Um, so don't, we do not recommend trying cold water swimming to this extreme. And it doesn't I mean think. that you could get close to that. I mean, you could just get close to 30 degrees Celsius and cut out. So um, yeah. clearly this guy's trained up to it. So very impressive. Yeah. Well, from one extreme to the other, this time going away from the cold temperatures, but over to the endurance side of sport. It was a recent record attempt by Wright Ratasap of Estonia to break the record for the Double Decker Ultra Triathlon, which previously stood at 251 hours. That is a long time to be doing 
anything. It is. Now to do this, he had to do 76 kilometers of swimming, 3,600 kilometers of cycling, and 844 kilometers of running. Yeah, well this was broken over 20 days, so it was actually broken down to being almost an Ironman every day, so you don't just get in and swim constantly for that far, but still, it is quite some challenge. But the disappointing fact was, well, first of all, he completed this in a time of 238 hours. So in theory, breaking the previous record by over 13 hours. Yeah, but there was some bad news for poor chap because yeah. the record didn't stand. So he didn't find this out until I think a fair bit afterwards when it you know, got submitted and it turns out that the Ultra Triathlon Association um, didn't have an official at the event because it didn't manage to have enough competitors to be able to warrant and afford an official and they've decided that you know the rules are the rules and that record isn't going to stand. Yeah, and that will now continue to be Dave Clamp from the UK, who had that previous record of yep. 251 hours. It is still his record, so yeah. It's still there to be broken, so if you fancy 20 days of racing triathlon, good luck to you. I'm out of here. <laughs> now then, if you are interested in competing at the Ironman World Championships, then this may well be of interest to you, because as you will know, Ironman have been celebrating their 40th anniversary at the Ironman World Championships this year, and in recognition of that, they are now offering out an extra extra 40 slots for the 2019 World Champs. Yeah, well to be eligible for one of those tickets, you basically have to enter any of their global events between now and the 20th of Jan, that's the final cutoff. It's gonna be three separate drawings, and then if you are lucky enough, you'll get a notification from Ironman and the chance to purchase your ticket or your entry fee for Kona next year. Okay, it's time to have a look at some of your pictures. And this week we are focusing on indoor training and your pain caves. And we've got a great selection. Starting off, this one sent in from Alina. Well, this is actually quite an interesting picture because if you look closely, the turbo is set up next to a hospital bed. Yeah, well this is coming from Germany. She's got a chronic disease, cystic fibrosis. So she has to spend quite a lot of time in hospital having checkups and whatnot. Um, and she, this time she decided she was gonna bring her road bike into the hospital, set it up on a turbo trainer um, so that she could sort of keep herself active and also sort of help to repair the lungs. Yeah, I mean, what an amazing way that, it's pretty cool that the hospital staff are open-minded enough to allow someone to bring their Which, turbo in. And that, I mean, it's, I mean, as much as I love the NHS in the UK, I don't think you'd have much space next to your bed. No, that's true. <laughs> she does actually say uh, the staff think she's crazy, but it keeps yeah. her focused and helps to get her lungs healthier. So, yeah, yeah. that's definitely an alternative pain cave. I love it. Fantastic. Oh, now we're moving to Qatar. This one comes in from Craig, and this well, it's, it's quite impressive, isn't it? It, it is. <laughs> On the spectrum as pain caves go, this is incredible. Yeah. He's got a giant Propel SL0 and a Scott Plasma Premium, and this is a a his and hers setup. Um, he's got. He's just done the final finishing touches to his pain cave. Uh, two Wahoo kickers, two Wahoo climbs, I mean, and two screens, individual screens. Forty-six for inch. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> um, with Zwift going on each of them. Um, so he said it's a great way to stay up the sandstorms. Um, yeah, you yeah, can't. Fantastic. I mean, I think I would cope with training indoors if I had that kind of setup. Yeah, very nice. He's also got bikes on the side. I can't quite. We've got a Scott uh, Plasma and an, um, a Planet X as well over there. Zip yeah. wheels, a couple of sets of zip wheels. There's no quite shortage the setup, of quite um, the set of kit there. <laughs> Yeah, fantastic. Um, now, this one is maybe a little bit more relatable with some yeah, of us. Yeah, I can um, definitely relate to this one. This one comes from Den uh, from the Netherlands, and he has got his bike set up alongside his washing machine and tumble dryer. Yeah, I love it. He's even managed to squeeze another bike hung up in the corner around the pipes here, which is quite incredible. But having said that, you know, the, the setup is relatable, but it's still a pretty nice bike. He's got the Olympia Icon with Mavic Cosmic Carbon Wheels and Altegra Di2, and he's using power to max power meter. So it's definitely got a good setup and it looks like, is that Zwift? I think that on his laptop, Zwift, just oh. about to start and potentially prepared for cold water because that wetsuit looks thick. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's very bright. Well, obviously it's inside out, but I can't quite figure out what brand it is, but very cool. Um, now this one is an open water swimming shot and this one is coming from Ontario in Canada and it's from Chuck. Okay, this is from the Welland International Flat Water Center. Yeah, and then it's going to a ride by Lake Erie and to the Niagara Falls, and apparently the run goes through the mist from the falls, so 
It's quite incredible. Yeah, I and mean, a beautiful shot as well where the sort of the mist and the fog yeah, is like burning off through the sun. So it's gonna turn into a nice day yeah, there. Quite eerie looking, isn't mm. it? But quite beautiful at the same time. We've got um, this one now from Phuket, and it is sent in by Olive. He's got his or her, sorry, uh, Scott Foyle with Mavic Cosmic Wheels. Six thirty-five a.m. Transition zone ready. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty <laughs> average, isn't it? For triathlon, we do love to start early. Oh, apparently Emma Pallant just walked past him. So very recent photo from out there and the humid conditions that they had. I'd just love to be somewhere warm like that right now. But yeah, he's got so he's got it's a road bike um, with some clip-on tri bars. I can just about make out there with his helmet propped up on it. He's got his bike shoe set up with elastic laces, so a very pro setup. Um, but yeah, very cool, very nice indeed. Yeah, well, nice to see people still racing this late into the season, but starting off into next season now, isn't it? But you're probably looking more at your off season, whatever it is you're up to at the moment. Do send us in some photos because we love sharing them with you. Well, now it is time for our GTN caption competition. And we've had some good captions coming in this week. We've got this one from the Dom Louis, and I'm going to try and say this in my best Spanish accent. No es lucha libre, es lucha tribre. Yeah, well, we're not completely sure of the translation <laughs> of that one. Well, but it means we like li like lucha libre. I think it's wrestling and lucha libre. I guess they're saying fight triathlon. <laughs> yeah, I mean. That was, uh, do we, think we, need, we think we need our Spanish um, friends to help us with some of these, don't we? Well, next we have um, this one from Race Pace Masters Swimming. No wall will stop me. It's a statement. <laughs> uh, Jared Bone, another Spanish one. Is this Iron Man? You're doing well at this, Mark. This is Iron Man. Now, Mark, as you're doing such a good job of pronunciations, I reckon you need to read out our winner because there's some interesting words here. <laughs> Come on, give it your best so, shot. Neil, Neil House is a. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. <laughs> uh, translation, this mask is really tight. <laughs> <laughs> I think you deserve a free swim cap for that rendition, to be honest. Well, Neil, congratulations. You win this week's GTN cap. Um, but we've got a fun one this week, haven't we? We have. Oh, well, I'm chuckling. And, I mean, you've probably noticed that Fraser hasn't joined us this week. And, Sorry, Fraser. Yeah, as a result, that means we get to choose the photo. And, well, it just happens to be a photo or a selection of photos of Fraser. Now, this was taken from our launch shoot, not our launch shoot, sorry, from our sunshine shoot. Launch shoot for Fraser. Yeah, well, it was, wasn't it? Um, out in Lanzarote. And we certainly put him through his paces as the new presenter. So much so, he didn't have time to eat or drink, so he was trying to eat a sandwich as he was trying to get in the water, and he, he didn't know where to put it. Didn't did know he? where to put it. Put it down his tri suit, um, and then a, went for a swim. Went for a swim. I mean, yeah. you do have to keep an eye out on our videos. Actually, it's a recent video if you want to see what happened when Fraser went for a swim with a sandwich down his tri top. But we would love to know your caption suggestions to this selection of photos. So please leave your caption suggestions in the comments section below. It's time for race news, and it's fairly succinct this week because it is that quiet time of year for races, but still, there were some significant performances over Ironman 70.3 Western Australia. Most significantly, it was the return to action for Terenzo Bazzoni, just five months after he got hit off his bike by a truck whilst training in New Zealand, and he was left with life-threatening injuries in hospital for quite some time, and it's taken a long comeback. He tried to get ready in time for Kona at the World Championships, but had to admit defeat a few weeks prior and realised he wasn't quite ready. But he certainly is ready now and he had a tremendous performance in Australia on the weekend. He came out of the swim with the lead group and then himself and Sam Appleton worked together on the bike. They increased a lead and by the time of T2 they actually had more than eight minute advantage over the chasers. And then it became a running race. And the overall results, it was Casey Munro who finished third. And then Sam Appleton couldn't quite hold on to that run pace. He came home in a second and Terenzo Bazzoni in his first race back took the overall win and he's just announced on Instagram that he is going to be racing the full Ironman in Western Australia in just a few days time. Well, in the women's race, it was kind of an opposite story in the fact that Radka Kalfelt actually had raced a full Ironman just a week previously to this, but it didn't seem to stop her. She put in an incredibly strong performance and left the rest of them chasing her. So in third place, it was Grace Feck. In second, it was Hannah Wells. And then winning by over four minute margin, it was Radka Kalfelt. Well, now it's time for question time. And we've had some great questions coming in over the past weeks. 
and you haven't disappointed. We've got some fantastic ones again this week. This one here from Arnpour Giz Alassan asks, during a race, can you have a watch pick up your speed, cadence, power meter from sensors on the bike at the same time as your bike computer? Now this is quite an interesting question because a lot of people try to do this or do do this. You'll want to race the entire triathlon with a wristwatch, yep. recording it all. So you start it on the swim, it continues all the way through to the run. But equally, you might want to have a bike computer on your bike as you do for when you're normally training. Mm. So you can see all the numbers in front of you, maybe when you're in the aero bars. Um, and the short answer is more than often, no, because your power meter sends signals via either ANT Plus or maybe via Bluetooth. And your device can only pick up one source at a time. So there is a chance that your bike computer could pick up via ANT Plus and your watch via Bluetooth, in which case, maybe you could pick up both on each, but that is very slim. And what I have heard from people is it can be a little bit glitchy. So it will like drop out on one and then back to the other. And there is the chance that maybe you're having it all on your watch and not on the yeah. bike computer. So if you have figured out a way of recording on both, or perhaps you've found certain power meters that yeah. send signals to both, We'd love to hear, so send that in. Great, great to find out. Yeah. Well, this next one is actually um, less of a question, more of a few comments and opinions. And, you know, we are open to criticism. We know we're not perfect and we know that we are English. Yeah, last week's show, um, someone picked up on my pronunciation <laughs> of the brand Nike, or mm. Nike, as we like to call it here in the UK. Yeah, now we've had a bit of grief for this. We have in the past, but this time it's sort of been even more noticed. And I think it's time that we, you know, put our hands up and explain why we say it as we do. Yeah, I mean, we could, every time we say something, we like I say, we say spanner here for the tool we use in the- Or for you, no, I'm joking. <laughs> Thanks, <sorry. laughs> uh, for tools that we use in the maintenance Myself, studio, maybe. but in America, you tend to say wrench. So we, we often say both, but it would get a bit boring if we said both. So sometimes we just get lazy and we just say yeah. what we're used to. And we have done our research, Nike is the official term and the official brand name for Nike. Nike. <laughs> now um, we're just confusing okay, ourselves. We're digging a hole here. It's when you've said something for you know 30 years or whatever, it's quite hard to change it. And you know, we respect the brand, but I think I'm probably I just can't change that. Yeah, I don't I'm, know why. I think a lot it's of really in difficult. The UK. Yeah, and next they're gonna be telling us it's Adidas, not Adidas. I mean what? Who? <laughs> yeah, so you know, our apologies are there and we will do our best to make ourselves clear to everyone watching. Our next one. Well, this one comes in from Master Decaster in the USA. My Garmin estimates calories burned during activities. How can I use this to make a nutrition strategy for a race? I've read you can only absorb up to 400 calories per hour. This gives me a huge deficit for every hour. Any help with this? Well, first of all, obviously it depends on the distance that you're racing because a calorie deficit within reason doesn't matter. But don't get so hung up on those on those numbers that your watch is telling you. It's more about you trying to get as much in. I don't know how much you manage to consume when you're doing a longer distance and if you do it by carbs or you do it by calories. I tend to work by, yeah, by um, carbs. So I, I work by the, 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 grams. the grams in the gels per hour, essentially. Yeah. So very simple. Um, but the main thing really is to make sure that you are trying this out in advance. So, yeah. and that does also mean riding or running at the intensity that you're gonna be racing. So you're, yeah. you're almost simulating a race. So doing some really hard brick sessions, yeah. bike sessions where you're going to be trying to yeah. absorb those carbohydrates. There's no point sitting on your sofa eating how many jelly babies that have, you know, 90 grams of carbohydrates Sounds per hour. Sounds like a great idea <laughs> I mean, it only was that simple to try. But yeah, go out there and practice and it's very much a matter of getting in as much as you can within reason. Well, basically, you just need to practice, like Mark said, and it's a matter of taking on as much as your body can cope with within reason. Yeah, and we do love reading all of your questions, so please do keep sending them in. Just any videos you see and you maybe want a little bit more explanation yeah. on the topic or just anything completely random, just post it below one of our videos, below our show, and use the hashtag question time, and we'll look through those questions and pull them out and answer them in the show. Well, that's it for this week's show. If you've enjoyed it, hit the thumb up like button. And to make sure you get all of our videos, just hit the globe to subscribe. And don't forget, our deals that are going on in the GTN shop at the moment, that ends on Friday and you can even get hold of jumpers, t-shirts, all sorts. And we've got some great stuff there so you can head on over to that by just clicking on the shop icon. And if you'd like to see my front crawl recovery video, 
That is that part of the stroke. Nice high elbow, low hand, which is not how I do what it. What are you about to do then? <laughs> uh, you can see that by just clicking down here. And if you want to see more of this action from Fraser and his sandwich, then there's, there's a video on the 10 things you need to know before your first triathlon. And that's just down here. He's going to get his back, own back so much. <laughs> we might be in trouble.